Welcome, everybody. For those who I haven't had the chance to meet before, I'm Kimberly Ringel. Um, I'm one of the assistant professors in uh, anesthesiology and critical care medicine, um, and I work closely with Dr. McAvoy in the perioperative space, and so am delighted to be involved as part of this seminar series. And today, I'm truly delighted to welcome Dr. Francis Chung to talk to us today. Um, Dr. Chung is a professor uh, in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at University Health Network uh, through the University of Toronto. And she's also the ResMed Research Chair of Anesthesia, Perioperative, and Sleep Medicine. Um, she is a co-founder and past president of the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine, um, and also currently serves as an editor at two journals, Anesthesia and Analgesia, and the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine. She is probably the world's leading expert on obstructive sleep apnea in the perioperative period, both the assessment and management, as well as the risk of poor outcomes for patients with obstructive sleep apnea. She created the Stop Bang Scoring System, which I think all of us are extremely familiar with and use every day, um, and has over 420 publications and has been cited almost 25,000 times. Um, and in 2017, as part of World Anesthesia Day, um, her paper, High Stop Bang Score Indicates a High Probability of Sleep Apnea, was chosen as one of the 25 most important articles in the history of anesthesiology by the British Journal of Anesthesia. So it is truly an honor to be able to learn from her today. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Chung, for joining us. Um, thank you very much, Kim Lee, um, for your introductions. And I'm very glad to speak to your prestigious university and prestigious department. Okay, um, I have to disclose my research support, which is from various organizations. And I do have a conflict of interest. The Stop Bank 2 is proprietary to our university. So this is a 50 year old um, um, female who have sleep apnea and she was non-compliant to CPAP. And what happened is she has a rotator sh shoulder repair and she had GA plus interscaling block. And then she was discharged home the same day. And essentially the son, which um, the son was living with her at about 10.30 AM discovered that she was dead. So it does happen um, after anesthesia in certain patients. So what is the global prevalence and burden of sleep apnea? So there are 17 studies in 16 countries. Nearly 1 billion people in the world have mild to severe sleep apnea. And about 400 adults have moderate to severe sleep apnea globally. So I am Mr. Bagley's attorney. Do you promise to hit the vein, the whole vein, and nothing but the vein? So help you God. So we are in a medical legal circumstances in anesthesia. And this is an example of 54 medical legal cases in a database. Mostly ENT surgeons and anesthesiologists were being sued due to death, permanent deficit, and oxic brain damage. Interop complications, they are inappropriate medication or inadequate monitoring. So in the literature, we review the case report of death or near death um, in the literature of sleep apnea. And there were 60 published cases. The mean age, very young, 49, 60% are male and morbidly obese. Undiagnosed sleep apnea is 17%. Partially treated and untreated sleep apnea is about 70%. So we actually examine what happened to sleep apnea patients that are not recognized. And how do they do after major non-cardiac surgery? And we actually able to recruit 1,200 patients in three continents in nine hospitals. These are 45 years and older. 
they have both sleep study done before surgery and they have major surgery. And we want to determine the association between how severe the sleep apnea and 30-day vascular event. And we find that one third of the patient had no sleep apnea, one third had mild sleep apnea, and moderate sleep apnea is about 20% and severe sleep apnea about 11%. So cardiovascular event occur in nearly 20% of the patients within 30 days after surgery. So they are deaf, myocardial injury, which is troponin, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary embolism, renal thrombosis drops, and the total event account about 19%. So how about the relationship with the sleep apnea? And the post-op cardiovascular event, you can see if there's no sleep apnea, the total cardiovascular event in these patients undergoing major surgery, 14%. Mild sleep apnea, 19%. Moderate sleep apnea, 22%. But almost one third of those who have severe sleep apnea have post-op cardiovascular event within 30 days. And the adjust hazard ratio is 1.49. So it's 50% higher. Now, this is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve of the primary composite outcome. And the vertical axis is the patient with the event, the percentage. The horizontal axis is the number of days. And this is the reference point is no OSA. And if you have severe OSA, the adjust hazard ratio is 2.23 higher. Moderate OSA um, is 1.47, but you see the 95% confidence interval statistically is not significant, and neither is mild OSA. How about the pre-op predictors? Are the pre-op predictors of post-op cardiovascular event? And what are the population attribute risk? So if you are older, it's about 16% um, risk. And we know impairment 9%, peripheral vascular disease about 8%, and sleep apnea contribute to 22% in this study. And people will say, okay, you are measuring troponin myocardial injury. That is not serious. We are concerned with our MI. So we did a post-op analysis. And we actually find if you have severe OSA, 10% will suffer from MI after major surgery if they have unrecognized sleep apnea. Now, how about stop bank? When you examine stop bank, Looking at stop bank zero to two, which is the reference point, when you have a stop bank score five to eight, the adjust hazard ratio is 1.68, so 70% higher risk. And if the stop bank score of three or four, the adjust hazard ratio is 1.50, which means 50% higher risk. And we find that with the patient, if they, we measure their oxygen saturation during the night and the total time during the night when they are desaturated up to 80%, when the total duration in those who have cardiovascular event, they have longer CT80. So these people have about 23 minutes have oxygen saturation less than 80% during the night. In those who have no cardiovascular event, uh, then it's only about 10 minutes. So the unplanned emission, again with the severe sleep apnea, the adjusted ratio is almost sevenfold higher. The moderate sleep apnea is about fivefold higher. 
and the mild sleep apnea about threefold higher. The unplanned um, intubation or post-op lung um, ventilation, again, we're looking at severe sleep apnea and moderate uh, sleep apnea. They are sixfold higher in this study. So the global surgery is about 300 million per year. And one in 10 have unrecognized severe sleep apnea. If we have 300 million surgery every year, that means 30 million may have severe undiagnosed sleep apnea and is twofold higher risk of cardiovascular events. So we actually did a systematic review and meta-analysis on surgical patient sleep apnea. But this time what we did is we compiled all studies in the literature and we study that those patients who actually have sleep study or hope sleep apnea testing to make sure that they really have sleep apnea that are diagnosed or undiagnosed. And there were 20 prospective cohort studies and nine non-cardiac surgery and 11 cardiac surgery. So the post-op complication in total is twofold increase. Cardiovascular complications, 50% increase. Respiratory complication, almost twofold increase. And the hospital and ICU admission is about 2.25 fold. So the anesthesia risk of sleep apnea are multiple factors. Sleep apnea by itself, morbid obesity, hypertension, and comorbidity. These all contribute to anesthesia risk. So there is a clinical conundrum. Many patients with untreated or undiagnosed sleep apnea are undergoing surgery every day. Why do not more patients have death or adverse outcomes? So we have to recognize sleep apnea in surgical patients. There are known patients with sleep apnea. Also, there are unknown, unrecognized sleep apnea or undiagnosed sleep apnea. And there are treated sleep apnea and untreated sleep apnea. So when we examine the sleep architecture in the post-op period, we actually find sleep efficient decrease on the night of surgery and also in the first one or two nights. And the light sleep stage one and stage two sleep increases during the night of surgery. And the slow wave sleep which is deep sleep is decreased. And the REM sleep is increased, but there is the literature say there is a REM rebound, but we did not find any REM rebound in our data. Now, this is a diagram showing the apnea hypopnea index, which is the number of apnea and hypopnea events per hour. And you can see here that the patient who have no OSA and those who have mild OSA, they have similar increases in apnea hypopnea index in the post-op period. For those who have moderate sleep apnea and severe sleep apnea, you can see there are significant increases in apnea hypopnea index afterwards. And the reason being that, okay, you say there's night three, but mind you, the increases are the highest on the night of surgery. However, these patients, about 70% of these patients receive oxygen given by the healthcare providers. So apnea hypopnea index is decreased because they measure oxygen desaturation. So essentially, then it shows less than night three. During night three, only about 
8% of these patients on oxygen. So you can see an increase in AHI in these patients. Now, with morbid obesity, there are several different types of obesity. And the male are usually android obesity. The female are usually gynecoid obesity with less worries. The android obese patient, they usually have intra-visceral fat and they are potential disaster for us. However, in those who have android obesity, they have thick subcutaneous fat. They are of lesser issue. Now, um, this is um, analysis of a stop bank questionnaire for sleep apnea across geographical regions. And we actually look at 47 study with about 27,000 participants in North America, South America, Europe, Middle East, East Asia, South or Southeast Asia. The stop bank score of three have excellent sensitivity, more than 90%, and high discriminative power to exclude moderate to severe and severe sleep apnea. And the negative predictive value of severe sleep apnea is about 91%. Um, and the AUC um, is very high, uh, more than 80% in all regions. Mind you, in East Asia, which is China and Japan, the AUC is very low. The reason being, in Asia and Japan, their sleep apnea is not due to obesity. They are mostly due to anatomical features due to the micro, um, the jaw being smaller. Now, the stop bang high risk and post op. Um, complication non-cardiac surgery. You can see here the post-op complication is about four fold higher. And the length of hospital stay in this full study is two days higher or longer. In cardiac surgery, the odds ratio is about two fold. The absolute risk increase is about 20% in cardiac surgery. And the new onset of atrial fibrillation, you can see here the absolute risk increase is about 10%. For intubations and ventilation, you can see here the odds ratio is about threefold higher. Now, um, the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine, we developed a pre op screening and assessment. Um, of the adult patient with sleep apnea. And we asked a number of questions. What are the best pre-op practices in surgical sleep apnea patients who are poorly adhering to therapy? And we say these patients may proceed to surgery provided that strategies for mitigation of post-op complications are implemented. And the risk and benefit should include consultation and discussion with surgeon and patient. Now, when should we refer patient to sleep specialist or any specialist for further evaluation? And when should we delay or cancel cases? And this is very controversial. Uh, for the panel, we have nine sleep experts. Um, but then we also have ENT surgeons, internal medicine, and we have 12 anesthesiologists. And there were great disagreement among everyone because the sleep expert and the internal medicine people felt that we should try to refer those patients before surgery. But the anesthesiologist on the team was said, we want evidence. At the present, there's not enough evidence to refer every single patient who may be at risk to refer to um, further evaluations. And the patients say, I got 99 problems and snoring is only one of them. Now, when should we have additional consultation? So essentially, if these patients, they're not complying with CPAP 
or we suspect that they have high risk of sleep apnea. We should only refer those who have obesity hypoventilation syndrome or those with severe pulmonary hypertension or resting hypoxemia of uncertain causes. So these three conditions are absolute must for cancellation and delays and referrals. Now, morbid obesity at the present is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, we want to sleep, exercise. I thought you said extra fries. So we do like to eat and we don't want to do anything. So who are these patients who have obesity hypoventilation? These patients are obese patients. They usually BMI more than 40. And their OSA very severe. Their oxygen saturation is usually less than 90%. However, when you see these patients, they are not cyanotic because the PA, the CO2, the oxygen has to be less than 60% before they become cyanotic. And the serum bicarbonate are usually higher. So 10 to 20% of the obese sleep apnea patients do have obesity hyperventilation syndrome. So essentially, um, the oxygen cannot get in, the CO2 cannot get out, and then you lead to elevation in serum bicarbonate. So obese patients, they hyperventilate overnight. However, when they wake up in the morning, they're able to return their CO2 to within normal limit within a short time. And the lesson today, the take home message today is bicarbonate is the hemoglobin A1C of carbon dioxide level. It represents the renal retentions of bicarbonate in response to hypercapnia. So these patients, they usually are very obese and they're short of breath easily. So the obese patient, the obese hyperventilation syndrome, they are more likely to develop post-op respiratory failure, post-op heart failure, post-op ICU transfer, tracheostomy, and higher ICU and length of stay. Now, whenever post-op respiratory failure occur in an obese patient with sleep apnea, then we should think of obesity-related hyperventilation. So we should be on high alert of this syndrome, which usually are not recognized. So when you suspect the patient, you can use stop bang, you can use SpO2 oximeter serum bicarbonate, if the patient is high risk, then what we should do is emergency surgery, we can go ahead, but we have to take into the precautions such as difficult airway, make sure you use short acting, quick emergence drugs, and also you make sure that these patients will receive PEP therapy afterwards. If there's major elective surgery, then we should consider referral to sleep medicine. Now, there are some management error in these patients, and these all lead to blunted ventilator response, such as you give more oxygen, you give excessive diuresis, you give sedations, anesthetic drugs, you know, sedative, all these will contribute um, to more risk. Now, sleep apnea patients are everywhere. And patients are often non-compliant with CPAP. So when we examine these patients, is it related to opioid dosage? 
in this um, case report series, we find that if the patient are on 10 to 25 milligram, the risk is increased by 50%. If the 25 milligram um, of opioid equivalent daily dose, then the risk is increased by threefold. Now, patient control analgesia is patient central apnea, patient cardiac arrest, please call attorney. Now, gabapentinoid, as you know, has been shown to be related um, to respiratory issues too, increased risk for need for naloxone. And um, Stavros Mesutas have examined regional anesthesia and sleep apnea. Essentially, the addressed risk for complication are lower in those of regional anesthesia. They have less need for mechanical ventilation, ICU, length of stay, and cost. Now, how about our patients? With known sleep apnea with day surgery, optimized medical condition, minimal opioid, CPAP, then you can proceed with day surgery. If the patient has suspected sleep apnea and they have optimized comorbid condition, minimal opioid, again, you can proceed with day surgery. If these patients, they are not optimized and they are not really suitable for day surgery. So essentially, we have to make sure these patients are optimized and they don't need a lot of opioids at home because sometimes even the case that I gave you earlier just now, that patient who died at home only had two oxycodone five milligram at home. So this is a 42 year old male who had UPPP, GA, patient was extubated when awake. In the PACU, um, low oxygen saturation, and the patient was reintubated and later died. Now, which ENT patients are not suitable as our patient? Now, um, this is for UPPP, um, tongue-based surgery, higher pre-op AHI, higher narcotic requirement of these patients, and if these patients have a lot of comorbidities. So for our patient, encourage your patient to sleep in the recliner. Communicate with your patients about the risk of sleep apnea. Communicate with your surgeons. Communicate with the nurses in PACU and day surgery unit so that everybody are on the same page. And try to avoid opioid at home um, if it is required, then ask the patient to take a narcotic pill in half. Uh, essentially, we should use and say, oh, you know, um, at home, if possible, or regional anesthesia and other alternatives. So um, the Bagavi from Mayo Clinic try to identify the patient at risk of post-op respiratory complication. She screened the sleep apnea and she evaluated these patients in the PACU. Essentially, she find that patients who have recurrent PACU event, such as apnea, if they stop breathing a couple of times, and if they have less eight breaths per minute, two times over 30 minutes, if they have oxygen desaturation, if their pain sedation mismatch. What is meant by pain sedation mismatch? Essentially, if they have a lot of pain and then you, you give them some opioid, then they actually is very sedated. And um, she find that if the patient is low risk or high risk of sleep apnea, but if they have no PACU recurrent event, then they have very low risk to develop complication in the ward. If these patients have recurrent PACU event, then they is more likely to develop post-op respiratory complication in the ward if they have high-risk sleep apnea plus they have recurrent PACU event. 
down, we did a study on APAP, which is auto titrated CPAP study. So this APAP is actually intelligent that you can sense um, the airway obstruction and auto titrate the needed CPAP to the patient. And we randomized them to APAP or no APAP. The patient received APAP three nights pre-op and three post-op night. And then we did a sleep study on night three. So the CPAP group are in green, the control group with no CPAP are in red. And you can see the apnea hypopnea index greatly decrease in those who actually have CPAP. So is obstructive apnea index and hypopnea index. And the respiratory arousal is also less. Now, um, we also follow some prospective cohort patients in those patients who actually have sleep apnea. And they were given a CPAP prescription by their physician. And we look at 132 patients, and we find only about 50% of these patients were consistently adherent to the CPAP pre-op and post-op. And the CPAP um, adherence, those who are adhering the CPAP, they have improved pre-op oxygen desaturation index. And this benefit was maintained on night of surgery. So another question that we want to ask is, do we really need CPAP? Can we just give oxygen therapy to our patients? So we did another study on these patients. And we actually randomized the patients to actually oxygen and no oxygen. And these are, mind you, newly diagnosed OSA patients. We just diagnosed them before surgery. And in those of oxygen is in green, those of no oxygen is in maroon red color. And you can see the oxygen desaturation index is greatly decreased in those who receive oxygen. And the overnight oxygen um, uh, saturation also decreased. <laughs> so, but there's a caveat. We measure these patients with oximetry and transcutaneous CO2. And we find that 11% of the patients have high transcutaneous CO2. And these patients actually have respiratory depressions. Sorry, I have to clear my throat. So one patient actually have very high CO2, 96%, a 96 millimeter mercury. And seven patients have transcutaneous CO2 more than 60. So this is something that is worrying. So is oxygen a friend or a foe in the period period? So this um, is a very interesting hypothesis or um, a graph to show what happened to the patient in terms of CO2 narcosis. When there is decreased ventilation, and you can see if the patient breathes room air, the SpO2 line is in red, and the PaCO2 is in green. When the SpO2 decreases to 60 millimeter mercury, which is 90% oxygen saturation, the alveolar CO2 would increases to 65 millimeter mercury. However, uh, if you give oxygen therapy to these patients, you can see that the alveolar oxygen saturation when is at 80 millimeter mercury, the CO2 is actually at 80 millimeter mercury too. And this will present carbon dioxide narcosis. And it may increase the chance of the patient having upper airway obstruction 
and respiratory obstructions and decrease in ventilation even further. And this another hypothesis about what happened in some sleep apnea patient. Again, this is hypothesis. So essentially this shows the ventilations, uh, repeated apnea and hypopnea. The green line is the CO2 and the SpO2 is essentially the red line. And you can see here that um, there is terminal arrest um, in here. So um, here you can see. So terminal apnea and arousal failure. Um, and this may mean death, um, but this is not proven. This was reported in a case report where they measure, um, looked at the oxygen saturations in one patient. This is not a surgical patient. So um, this is a medical patient. So we did the sleep apnea and nearness registry um, by the Society of Anesthesia and ASA. And we collect a large set of cases we identify recurrent pattern of sleep apnea. And there were 75 case reports of sleep apnea from North America, but we exclude nine cases due to events in the OR or transport. So we analyzed about 66 cases. So you can see here, the patients um, diagnosed with sleep apnea is about 83%, suspected is about 17%. Most of them are ASA3. Um, they're relatively young still, 53 years old, and morbidly obese, BMI 38. Majority of them are inpatient, and majority are elective, and majority are general anesthesia. Now you look at here in the circle, the death or severe brain damage is about 63%. And critical event is about 37%. And critical event means something happened, there is a cold call, and then the patient was able um, to be resuscitated. So where does this happen? In the step down and IC unit, about 14%. In the PACU, 9%. In the ward, 56%. At the home, about 21%. And when does it happen? After the end of anesthesia, two hours in after anesthesia in PACU, in the step down unit, about 12 hours, in the ward, about 16 hours, at home, about 28 hours. So, and what is the comparison between those? Um, in terms of death or critical event. And you can see here in those who are in the ward, who die in the ward, they are more death and um, brain damage. At home, even more death and brain damage than critical event. In the PACU and ICU, you can see here that there are more critical events. When you look at the um, data of monitoring, when the patient will monitor at the time of the event, they are actually less likely to have death or near death. So the death and brain damage more likely to occur with unwitnessed event, no supplemental oxygen, the lack of respiratory monitoring, and combination of opioid plus sedative. And the post-op PEP use, using oxygen and central respiratory monitoring, they are not completely protective against catastrophic event because we do have some of these patients that in spite of these, they still have a you know, death or near death. So in conclusion, the undiagnosed sleep apnea patient, they are likely to have better period monitoring. 
you undiagnosed sleep apnea, unrecognized sleep apnea, or untreated sleep apnea patients, they're more likely to get into trouble. So this is a scenario similar to MH. In the 60s or early 70s, there are deaths related to MH. But we start to ask the history of anesthesia, past history, family history, and we rule out MH susceptible patients. And then when we have an event, we have them to. Now, can we ask the history of sleep apnea? Do we ask specifically, do we screen for undiagnosed sleep apnea? Do we ask the family history of sleep apnea? If you have a sibling or a parent that has sleep apnea, you are two times more likely to have sleep apnea. And do we rule out suspect sleep apnea patient? And if we do have such a patient and they have problems, we can give CPAP in the PACU and in the ward. So thank you very much for um, your attention. And thank you again. I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Chung, for that excellent talk um, and for all the amazing work that you have done in the past years. Um, I'm happy to um, let others jump in and ask a question, um, or I have a handful myself, but I'll open it up and, and check the chat here for a second. Um, and if you want to just unmute, um, and ask a question. I don't have a question, Kimberly, but I did want to just mention to everybody that the CME code is in the chat as well. So please check that out and um, you can text it. It's 57460. Okay, thank you. Kim, I have a question. I'll just put it, throw a quick question out. So thank you, first, first of all, Dr. Chung, for your comments. This is Dr. Ted Yegmon, one of the participants on this call. I. Uh, Oh, you, we, we've talked a little bit about what patients we would avoid and what patients we wouldn't, but in some situations, you're not, you know, you don't have the luxury of, of avoiding a patient. You know, that's me who's talking. So if that's true, now clearly the least amount of opioids we, we give are going to be an advantage and of course, multimodals. But if you had to pick, if you had to tell us or advise us like, okay, you're going to have to use, you end up having to use something. What would you, how, what would be your recipe for the safest way to get the patient through when you knew that, unfortunately, the operation's got to go and they're not going to get better clearly that day? Are you talking about outpatient or inpatient? I, I guess we could say, let's just make it both, but I would start with outpatient because those are the ones we're trying to avoid admitting to the hospital for this. But some of the inpatient situations are usually the reason why we're forced to do a case, right? It's very rarely that a patient needs an outpatient procedure and they get to go home and that surgery has to be done that day. Although with hospital pressures in the United States, that may not always be relevant, but just throwing that out there for you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think what happened is I am always um, worried. Thank you. I think this is a very relevant question that face all of us because we do have a lot of pressure of hosp hospital beds and especially in Canada and similarly in USA. And we are doing a lot of shoulder arthroplasty surgery and sometimes ACL as our patient and these patients have a lot of pain afterwards. So I do always worry about them. I usually, if I worry about a patient, I will talk to the surgeon and explain because they are the ones that order the post-op. And I also, um, when I see the, that particular patient is pre-op, I also warn the patient. And also if the family are present, I also warn the family about their risk. And usually I document in the chart what I said. So that is all documented in, in case there's some event that happened. So I, I still, I guess, um, everybody knows it's multimodal to avoid opioids. So there are lots of options I'm not going to go through. But your question is, we, we still use oxycodone 5 milligrams. That's what we use um, in our center. 
I don't know what we use um, in your center. Edward, uh, what do you use in your center? Uh, that's very similar. I just was curious if you had any magic bullets. <laughs> I don't have. So, but the only thing is I actually asked the patient not to sleep on their back. So if they have a recliner, because patients usually if they sleep on the back, they obstruct. Um, we can ask them to sleep on the side, but a lot of times when they sleep, they don't know. So I, I actually asked the patient if they can have a recliner or chair not to sleep and I explain the reason why. So um, if they can be upright, more upright sitting positions on the first night in all two. So I, I do think that will actually elevate because a lot of time is the tongue falling back. And the other thing is that I, I will actually ask the patient to cut the oxycodone in half, you know. So hopefully if that doesn't relieve the pain, then they take the other half. So those, but in spite of that, I still have a lot of worry in these patients go home. Thank you. I was one curious, you know, if we end up newly diagnosing sleep apnea, is there an amount of time before an operation that people need to be using a CPAP um, to really see benefit in, in decreasing their risk or, um, you know, can it be done in just a few days or as, as long as they start wearing one um, or do they need some time on the therapy? So Kimberly, this is a very, very good question and actually is a million dollar question, billion dollar. The, the reason is I actually asked this question and I tried to look up the literature. I couldn't find any literature of the optimal time. So when I go to the medical area, what they do is um, the evidence about hypertension, they can decrease by a few millimeter of blood pressure. In fact, it's still small, but actually the study are six weeks of CPAP. And so essentially in order to get that small amount of blood pressure elevations or reduction, you need six weeks. But in the surgical patients, we don't have that. So I did the study which I showed. We just give three days. So in our unit, we actually have, um, if we really suspect a patient that have problem, we may cancel the patient. So um, actually there is a patient that come for surgery, but um, the pre-op clinic, the anesthesiologist see the patient. And however, the patient actually have 88% um, oxygen desaturations in the pre-op clinic and for no reason. And he is about 55, a little bit stout and no other issue except hypertension. And so essentially the, the anesthesiologist talked to me and I said, maybe we should postpone because this patient is having a surgery, orthopedic surgery, which is very painful. It's, it's sort of like a bony procedure um, that required opioid. So we postponed him and have a sleep study. And mind you, about a month or two months later, I happened to see this patient and I gave the, the anesthetic. And essentially the, the sleep study shows the HI is around very high, about 75 events per hour. So he did have undiagnosed sleep apnea. He did have the oxygen desaturation without himself or sleep he recognizing. So I, I do think that probably um, the pre-op oximeter is very useful for us um, to determine whether the patient is at high risk or low risk. And the other thing is um, we have um, some friendship or established a relationship with the sleep physicians that we can refer them and they would try to do the sleep study within one week. But it is not essential because as the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine, we, in our guideline, we recognize the difficulty in getting a consult, the difficulty in getting CPAP um, pre-op. 
So we actually said you take precautions. It's only three exceptions that you really, really need them. Otherwise, you can give the CPAP afterwards. So um, in the PACU or in the, um, in the ward, you know, you, you can try to because they are respiratory therapies that can help us. So essentially, unless the patient has obesity hyperventilation syndrome, they have idiopathic hypoxemia, like the example I've shown, and also pulmonary hypertension, you can probably go ahead with these patients provided that you monitor these patients afterwards. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions? <laughs> I did have, a, I guess, a, another question about monitoring postoperatively. Um, just hearing you talk about sort of the recliner and the positioning, you know, in the ICU, we think a lot about keeping intubated patients 30 degrees head of bed to prevent ventilator acquired pneumonia. Is that something that we should think about in our sleep apnea patients where we um, keep the head of the bed elevated um, and send them to a monitored floor to help prevent these events postoperatively? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, 30 degrees head up if possible, if they don't, if the surgery doesn't contraindicate this. Um, there is a study that was published uh, about a year ago in anesthesiology, and I think the authors are from Japan, and they did examine the head up positions and also nasal high flow and the combination. So they did show that 30 degree head up have some benefit. That, yeah, again, that's excellent questions, yeah. So there are some things that we can do, um, you know, that can help a lot. Um, I, I do think that common sense is very important. I do find that um, the packing nurses are very, very important. I have two times been saved by packing nurses. I have one patient who had lumbar surgery and he is relatively young in his 40s. And the nurses in the patio uh, was telling me that he has apnea, um, repeated apnea. And I was looking at him and we, we did send him to a monitor bed. And then when we talked to the, to the wife, the wife to say he actually does have a snoring and obstruction at night. And then I think there was another occasion that uh, the nurses were saying this patient is having obstruction and shouldn't be going home. So I always listen to the packing nurses. And um, we try to educate them because I do find the nurses and the day surgery are your best friend. They would be able to tell you whether your patient can go home or cannot go home. That absolutely makes sense. Um, Looks like we have a couple questions here in the chat as well. What was the thought behind setting the cutoff of stop bang to three when looking for severe OSA? Um, because the odds ratio involved scores of three and four. Um, uh, that is a very, very good question, Amando. I, I think um, most people now use um, stop bang five or greater because I think the probability of moderate or severe sleep apnea is much higher, about 60 to 70%. So um, when you're using cutoff three, you have a lot of uh, false positive. So I think most people are trending to use a higher score. Yeah. Excellent. And then the follow-up question, or the second question was, why are one in five patients found to have post-operative complications at home? Are there ways for us, our systems to attenuate the number of complications at home? Um, so, um, Nando, can you clarify this about one in five post-op complications? Which study are you referring to? Oh, yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. By the way, Dr. Chung, that was a, a great presentation. And uh, 
Um, I yes, the the the, the um, study I was referring to was looking at post-operative complications at different healthcare settings, and um, I, I think what shocked me the most was the fact that one in five uh, patients are found to have complications uh, after discharge at home, uh, and they are more, more likely to have uh, poorer outcomes as a result. So I was wondering if there are ways for our systems to kind of attenuate that number of discharges uh, to make sure that we're not discharging the wrong patients. So, okay, thanks, thanks, Amanda. That's a good question. So um, you're referring the sleep apnea registry. So the sleep apnea registry uh, uh, reported from the cases. So essentially uh, on that data, um, we show that that is because we have 66 cases in total that actually either have respiratory event, critical event that can be resuscitated and the patient may recover with a little bit of damage or, or completely recover or death or near death. And the, when the event happened, so that is not one in five complications, but actually out of that 66 cases, 21% of these patients are day surgery patients. And out of those 66 cases, about half happened in the ward. So um, that was the num the percentage of patients um, that reported by um, the physicians or anesthesiologists from individual hospital. So about 19% of the 66 patients um, they are day surgery patients and they have critical event. Um, but they're more likely to have death because when they have an event, they're more likely to die of it than uh, being able to be resuscitated. Excellent. Well, I see that we're a couple minutes past time here, um, but thank you so much for this extremely informative talk and for all the work that has gone into it um, and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to spend time with us today. Um, this has been really, really excellent and, and we're thrilled to have had this opportunity. And we also invite everybody to come back next week for um, another seminar on frailty. Um, so uh, I hope everyone weather has passed and everyone is staying safe. Um, and I hope that everyone has a great evening. So Kimberly, I would like to join. <laughs> yeah. 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 It will hey, awesome. Kimberly, I'm gonna interrupt for two seconds. I just wanted to say hi to Francis. Hey, Francis, this is Michael Pilla. Hi, I'm glad to Sorry, see you. I'm working. Oh, you're in the OR. Oh, yes. Okay. Always nice to hear you and eventually see you again. Good to see you. Okay. Thanks.